had the opportunity to introduce Fuzzy Cohen, actually, he spent his life before he was in Los Angeles, in New York and in Shore Hills, New Jersey. And I spent my life before I lived in Los Angeles, in Shore Hills, New Jersey, and in New York. So we have something in common besides both being graduates of Columbia. In addition to that, we're members of the same congregation out here in California. And it's a pleasure to find somebody who didn't have to go to the business school to make a lot of money. He made it just from going to the college because he's a very bright guy. I had to go two schools to get to the same place in life as he did by just going to one. His father, ran a very successful business in Livingston, New Jersey, as a retailer for many, many years, and has recently retired, and is very proud of his son. And you're gonna see why he's proud of him when we all have the pleasure of talking with him tonight. So without further ado, I'll turn it back over to see what we can do tonight. Buzzy. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for that great introduction, Rick. I appreciate it. And I'm excited here to talk to some Columbia alums. I'm very proud of, of that. And I'm excited. I was very excited when um, Courtney reached out and invited me to speak with everyone because um, beyond Jeopardy and other stuff, I have this uh, new audio book that just came out about a week and a half ago. And uh, I'm excited to be talking about that with people, so um, I, I, th I thank the Columbia SoCal Club for the opportunity. Thank you for joining us, Buzzy. I'm really excited. Um, I'm gonna try and stop making the camera on my computer shake. Um, <laughs> very badly doing that right now. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Everybody is muted right now, and only the host has the ability to ask you to unmute. And that's just, um, we are recording this, so that'll help us with a more seamless recording. Um, if you do have questions that come up that don't come up as a part of our conversation, you can send them in the chat to Russ, who's one of the co-hosts and one of the members of leadership in our club, and he'll shoot them over to me so that we can get them to Buzzy as well. Um, so yeah, with that, um, the fact that you mentioned your book is a good entree into the questions that I had for you. So what uh, inspired you to write the book? How did you go from being trivia champion to being an author? So um, I first appeared on Jeopardy in uh, 2016, spring of 2016. And I was, I'd prepared to be on the show the way that most people prepare to be on the show, which is I would sit every night and I would watch Jeopardy with a ballpoint pen. And I would like click along with Alex, you know, with the players and, try to get used to Alex Trebek's cadence and answering correctly. And that was pretty much the extent of it. And um, either by a stroke of luck or just having done a lot of uh, time, spent a lot of time when I was in, after college in, on Wikipedia, I was able to win the first game that I played and then I just kept going. And I ended up taping two consecutive tape days um, for to tape 10 games, I only won nine. Um, because as as most of you probably know, when you go on Jeopardy, even when you win, they make you keep playing until you're a loser. Um, so everyone everyone is a loser who's been on Jeopardy, basically. Um, so um, what what the actual taping experience was like was totally different from watching the show at home for a ton of reasons. And when I realized I was going to have to go back and be on the Tournament of Champions, uh, which was taping in uh, the fall of 2017, um, I said to myself, I need to, this is the big leagues now, and I want to be better prepared. And so I started to think about what were the parts of taping Jeopardy that I wasn't prepared for. For example, uh, they ask you to be at the studio dressed and ready at 7.30 in the morning and I'm not a morning person. And so I was already kind of sluggish and 
all that stuff. They, uh, they tape, as I said, five shows in a day, which is a lot more rigorous and a lot more taxing on your brain and standing up for that long on your body than most of us are used to, right? We're all, m most people are not on their feet from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, unless you are working retail like Rick. Um, and the intensity of playing against the other people, um, having to answer the questions in a really stressful situation, even just knowing, you know, getting used to turning on the, the kind of trivia part of your brain at 10 a.m. when you're used to practicing it at seven o'clock, like right about now, right, is when normally I would flip into Jeopardy mode. All of this stuff um, informed the way that I prepared for Jeopardy. So um, I would do things like if I took, like instead of, you know, when my coffee break at 10 a.m., I would study then instead of at the end of the day. Um, I would, um, to, to I, I got up for an entire month before tape day at the time I was going to have to get up for the taping so that at least I was like kind of used to that and it wasn't like, all right, I'm sleeping until 7.30 or whatever and then all of a sudden I'm waking up at six. Um, I wore a suit and a tie every day for months and I still do actually. Um, and that was just like, made it so that on tape day, I saw it in the green room, people would get in there and they would be uh, trying to figure out how to get their tie on. I mean, one guy who was a friend of mine, like flat out told me that he basically had to have, they had to have Alex's wardrobe guy come out and tie his tie for him. And that, that doesn't maybe seem like a big deal, but when you're about to have a big performance, like having to have someone else tie your tie is kind of an infantilizing experience and maybe doesn't make you feel as confident as you could. Um, and so these were all like little things that I was doing to try to better be better prepared for that day so that when challenging things happen, I wasn't as thrown off by it. The, the biggest thing that I, I, I did in that phase of my Jeopardy training, which I really had this mindset, like I was gonna be a an olympic i approached it like i was an olympic athlete like i remembered those ads where it was all the people that worked at home depot that were olympic athletes and it's like okay they managed to have a job and and really devote time and energy to training properly i'm going to do the same thing so when i would go to the gym and exercise i would hand one of the trainers my stack of flashcards uh and have him quiz me while i was exercising and the reason for that was that I was trying to recreate um, the, the stressful situation of being on the show and, and having something that I knew that I couldn't get out of my head. So um, there's, when you, if you talk to other people who have been on the show, there are questions that they miss that they're like, of course I knew that, of course I knew that, right? But they couldn't come up with it in the moment because the lights are on, the pressure's on, and so what I was basically did was recreate the pressure of being on the show through hanging from a chin up bar or hold or holding a plank. Cause I'm not a very athletic person. And so that basically, I can't like spell my name at that point. So how can I come up with the capital of Brunei, you know, and this was the sort of thing I would do. So it wasn't that I was getting rid of the stress, but I was learning how to train my brain and, and my whole self to be able to work through the stress and not have that like cortisol that's coursing through my brain make it so I couldn't access information that I had. So this was kind of this holistic approach. And then I, I really, I mean, if you look at it statistically, I outperformed myself in that tournament of champions um, and came back from a pretty tough first game of the finals, partially because I had prepared for things to be hard and bad and challenging and I could kind of just focus and keep moving forward. Um, when I finished taping, I got really hooked on this whole preparation thing and decided on a whim to enter a deadlifting competition because I was already going to the gym to study the flashcards. And I ended up training for nine months and, and winning the um, AAU national deadlift competition in my weight class. And so I just kind of, I've kind of kept on doing stuff I've learned, I took up tap dancing uh, a couple, maybe about a year ago or so. I mean, I don't know where time is right now with the quarantine, but um, so I had this thing where I was like, oh, I can really, if I really do a concerted kind of preparation, I can 
improve my ability to perform in in high stakes situations. And so initially I kind of just had this idea and I and I'll I can share the, a little bit of the story of how this turned into a book. Um, and initially what happened was a, a, a documentary filmmaker was talking to me about doing something about the deadlifting or the tap dancing or something like that. And he thought what was the most interesting thing was how I kind of approach the preparation. Like he's like, whatever the end result, it doesn't matter, but it's kind of amazing how you, you know, just became a maniac about how you prepare yourself. And uh, at the same time, I was on a podcast of a fellow Columbia alum named Michelle Collins, who now has a Sirius XM show um, on Sirius XM stars. And she had me on her well, then podcast with another um, uh, former Jeopardy contestant, um, a guy named Louis Vertel, who has a podcast called Keep It, which is kind of a pop culture pop podcast. Um, and then a third Columbia alum heard me on that podcast. And she was a literary agent and said, hey, I would love to talk to you about maybe uh, writing a book. So she approached me. And then in the course of writing this, I got a chance to interview some really incredible people. And, and the idea basically of the audio book, which is called Get Ready, is, is that um, whatever you have to do, you can probably be better prepared for. And it's kind of like a little guidebook or a recipe book on... Um, you know, what you can do, how you can approach your preparation, not necessarily this is how you need to prepare, but hey, have you considered this? Have you thought about this? Here are some ways to approach all these different things. Um, and again, the idea being that, um, you know, there's, I think, like 17 chapters. And the idea is like, you know, you may not need every chapter, but you, it's like a travel guide, you know, if you're going to Italy, you might look through the whole Italy guide, but then once you decide what cities you're going to, you kind of focus on that. And that's the idea of this. It's like, it's a whole bunch of different things to consider for preparation, but then you do whatever it is you have to do. Um, you, you focus on those um, pieces that, that you feel like you need or you want to work on. Um, and I, I'll stop rambling because it feels like Courtney is ready to ask me something else. But I <laughs> well, honestly, you answered a, a number of my questions in that. So I'm going to try and like <laughs> finesse them so that you're giving us more information. So one of the things that you mentioned is that you got to interview a lot of amazing people for your book. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about um, who those people were and how you kind of selected the people that would be um, your subjects that you talked about? Sure. Um, I... In looking back on it, a lot of them are are kind of creative people because I, I happen to work in a creative field. Um, my day job is as a music supervisor for commercials. Um, and so uh, one of the first people I spoke to was the um, uh, a cre uh, chief creative officer by the name of Duncan Milner, who for like 15 years, every week was presenting work to Steve Jobs. Um, probably like one of the most challenging clients uh, in the world. And I knew him because I'd worked at this agency that did all this Apple work. And I also knew that he had taken improv classes. And that was kind of like the first person I spoke to because I was like, that's a, and, and he, and as, as I explained in the book, he, he took the improv classes at the suggestion of a couples counselor. Um, because the couples counselor was like, in improv, you need to listen. Um, and what you're, that's like the active listening is the skill that he felt was missing. And as opposed to just, uh, you know, sit, you know, sitting in couples counseling, fighting about it, he's like, why don't you do this? It's kind of a fun way and you'll, you'll develop the skill. And what he realized was, hey, that's actually an incredibly helpful thing for my work environment. And he, when I was at the agency, he would bring in the teachers from this improv school and have them give like day long improv classes for creatives working on all kinds of things that work on active listening because one of the reasons Steve Jobs had a, had a reputation for being such a hard client was because people didn't listen to him they came in with what they wanted to sell and if he didn't like it they they shut down instead of listening to the feedback he was giving so that was like a really I thought a really great person I spoke with and then a, a big thing for me in finding the people that I was interviewing with is I've, I've read a bunch of these um, 
kind of performance business books in preparation for writing this. And it's always kind of like, you know, the Olympic cycling team or, you know, world-class tennis players or violinists. And it's like, great. We know those people are great at it, but it's also, and there's a reason that they pick those people because they're, they, you know, they've kind of refined what they do to such a high degree. And I was kind of interested in also finding some interesting, unexpected people. So I interviewed a woman who did competitive coffee brewing, uh, which is not that even That was a like, really interesting part. <laughs> yeah. It's not even like latte art. It's like literally like they hand you beans that you've never, you don't know what the coffee beans are and you're, you have to brew the best cup of coffee out of those beans that you can. So you're, you know, you have to make decisions about grind size, how hot the water is, how long you leave the, you know, the ground coffee in the water, all of these things that there's all these variables. And the idea is you have to make three identical cups and give them to the judge and make it as, you know, as good as you can. And also, you know, if you say, well, this coffee, blah, 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 you know, almost like a sommelier, if they don't taste that, then forget it. So it's, there's a lot going on and it's a very high stakes, high pressure situation. And what I tried to do is find people like that. I interviewed a really interesting glass blower. Um, uh, and what I tried to do was find people where it was sort of this like sort of entertaining, but also extreme situation because Jeopardy was an extreme situation, but in, in the extremeness of it, it also brought into relief how, how ill prepared I had been initially and how much better prepared I was going back. And so I wanted to know in other more extreme situations, what kind of things we could learn so that in the less extreme day to day of job interviews, uh, sales presentations, um, you know, raising money for projects. I spoke to a US attorney about how he does interviews for, you know, when, when they depose, when they do depositions and when he cross examines people, like these are the things that we do every day where we need to basically in a much smaller way, have that same performance mindset. Right. It was, um, it was definitely really interesting to see how you kind of synthesized the notion of learning about how to refine your process in terms of preparing like at that being a crucial element of the preparation process um that over time you kind of said okay when i first started out this is what happened and these are the places where i saw that i was too tired when I was drilling just the state cap or the country capitals, the world capitals, right. um, without any sort of context. So I could like recite them in rote memorization, but not necessarily identify them on a map. So right. I'm hearing that we might want to hear a little bit more about Jeopardy. So maybe a fun anecdote from your shooting days there. What what's something that's super fun that other people might not be able to get, except in this exclusive context. So um, this was something that I learned during the, the All-Stars taping, uh, which was the team tournament that I, we did, um, I, I guess it was a year ago, maybe a little more than a year and a half ago. Um, so, I, you know, it was, I was there, Ken Jennings was there, Brad Rutter was there, Alex Jacob, it was all these people. There's probably like 300 Jeopardy episodes worth of experience on the stage and all of us learned for the first time, which blew our minds, which is that um, when during a daily double, right? The it's one person is being asked the question. Okay. So that there's no like beep, 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 like it normally happens, but it's unclear how long you get. And so we were like, how long, how long do we get? You know, can you tell us how long we get when you ask us the question? And we found out that Alex Trebek has the bu the button and he just decides whenever <laughs> he thinks you're done. Because what, what we asked was like, sometimes he'll say, he'll prompt you and ask you, hey, do you have an answer? And then, and then you're like, oh, I can't come up with it. But sometimes he doesn't. And it, something actually happened where we were expecting, my teammate was expecting to get the prompt. And when he heard the noise, he blurted out the answer and it was too late. 
but it was we'd had this whole conversation and it turns out that Alex Trebek just has the button and he just hits it whenever he feels like it, whenever he thinks you're you've had enough time. So um, he's just toying with you. <laughs> he's just toying with you. That I learned very recently. It took me a lot of games to learn that. Um, I think you know, I think the fact that they tape so many shows in a row is really a big surprise for most people, like taping five shows in a row and they have you bring a change of, two changes of clothes and in between episodes, they run you backstage and they, they have you change as fast as you can and they're like yelling at you and um, to like change faster because they're on a schedule, right? It's like a union shop. So if, if tape day goes over, you know, that's a big deal. Yeah. So, um, so it's really, uh, again, you have no time. And one of the reasons the first time I was on the show that on the final Jeopardy, when I had a runaway game, when I had more than twice as much, that I bet zero and would just like make a joke answer was because I realized I needed, I needed a break and I really didn't have one. I really didn't have a break because by that time, not only are they asking you to get changed, but they've run out of the little stories that they give Alex Trebek on the card. And so while you're changing, they're asking you to come up with more stories for him to talk to you about. And I was just like, you know what? If I get five minutes in here where I do not have to like figure something out, I'm going to, I'm going to take it. And so a lot of people thought that I was like leaving money on the table or well, really, I bet zero because I was like, cool, I'm going to take a break because I need it. And then I did the joke answer thing just for fun. Um, but really, it was more about giving my brain that chance to reset. Because, man, after the shows, after the Tournament of Champions, like, I was, I was wiped out. It's, it's really intense. And, it, and it's physically intense, too. You know, most, of, most people who go on the show are wearing dress shoes or something. And like I said, you're on your feet all day. They're, you're walking, you know, even before the tape day, they have you go out on stage. You tape some small promo stuff. They, so it's, it's a really... Um, kind of a whirlwind um the other thing that a lot of people i'm trying to think of what other stuff people usually like to know about they do not give you the categories beforehand i don't know who started that rumor <laughs> but they do not give you the categories beforehand you show up and literally as alex trebek is reading the categories that's when you find out what you're gonna have to answer um and um the other thing that i talk about in the book is how the buzzer works which a lot of people are really interested in. So the way that that works is there is a person and he's been doing it for forever, basically this guy, he's one of the researchers on the show. And when Alex Trebek says, basically finishes talking, they enable the buzzers. If you buzz in before it's enabled, in other words, if you try to buzz in while he's still reading, you get locked out for a quarter of a second and you cannot buzz in and answer for that quarter of a second. Now, during a regular game, that might be okay because the other people might not know the answers or they may get it wrong. But once you get into like tournament of champions or the all-star thing, that was, you were dead in the water if you, if you got locked out. So, so what you're trying to do is basically time it exactly for when Alex is done reading. And that's why you see people kind of jamming on the, on the buzzers. And they actually tell you to do that. It's so funny that people, you know, at home are like, oh man, it looks like this guy's kind of trying to crush his buzzer. The, the contestant coordinators tell you to do that because the contact on the in the buzzer is is not all the way at the bottom. So they don't want you to just jam it. They want you to go over and over again so that wherever that contact point is for the buzzer, it passes it as many times as possible, right? So you have the most chance of it passing at the right time. Um, and um, uh, where was I going with that? I, I can't remember, but yeah. that So the buzzer thing, what I did, I, I, got a, I got a special app for my computer and I got a USB buzzer, which was just a, a keystroke basically. And I would practice, um, I practice buzzing in, but then I would do things where I would change up the delay a little bit, right? So um, I would have to wait 30 milliseconds before I could buzz in. And just like, as okay, can I adjust? How long does it take me to adjust to slowing myself down 30 milliseconds and get back into my kind of groove. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to zero milliseconds. How, how quickly can I adjust back? 100 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, just keep changing it up and, and see not, not just 
can, how accurate can I get it? But how long does it take me to adjust? Because that's a big thing that you're doing on the, when you're taping is you're, adjust, you're constantly needing to adjust your timing. And it's really hard, like I say, when you've got a lot of adrenaline, a lot of cortisol, you just want to get in as fast as you can. And people say, oh, I'm going really fast. Why aren't I getting in? And it might be you're going too fast, you know? Um, how can you slow yourself down? That's a really hard skill to do quickly. And a lot of what I would do on the show is spend the Jeopardy round dialing in my timing and experimenting a little bit like, oh, what if I go a little faster? What if I go a little slower? But, you know, so I maybe missed a couple of questions that I should have gotten because I was kind of, you know, using that time to dial in my timing. And then in double Jeopardy where there's, you know, more than twice as much money with the daily doubles um, at play, I would just, I would be ready to roll because, you know, if you're still trying to figure it out in double jeopardy, you know, bless your heart. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> bless your heart. Okay. <laughs> so we have a couple of audience questions. Great. Um, yeah. One of them is uh, from Marsha Browse is, do you have a photographic memory? Um, I don't have a photographic memory, but I do have a very good relational memory. So it's a, it's a little bit of a different thing, but I'm, I'm really good at connecting, like, which is really what Jeopardy is all about. It's, you know, there'll be, within a clue, there'll be three clues, you know, clues within each clue. So when you hear, um, you know, a certain word that needs to make it clear to you what they're asking right so um if you hear um um uh i'm trying to think of like a really really clear example off the top of my head uh if you hear hoosier this hoosier or blah 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 hoosier what are we talking about right can i anyone like are stairs everybody's no, on mute but um we can unmute everybody and see <laughs> see what they have this to say. Just just for this for just for this dumb uh, dumb example I have. Hoosiers. Hoosiers. Anybody know? I don't. This is why I'm not on Jeopardy. It's the it's the Gene Hackman movie, right? Right, but what are they talking about if they refer to someone as a Hoosier? Someone from Indiana. Someone from Indiana, teams. right? Right. So so it's there are these little things that they'll do all the time, and it's like. Uh, so if it's like this Hoosier poet, then okay, we're talking about a poet from Indiana, right? So there's these, there are these ways that they, they embed these clues into it, into them, into each other, that there's only so much Jeopardy can really ask about because people at home need to know what they're, what they're talking about. So what I got really good at was knowing the kinds of things that Jeopardy asked about. I didn't need to know everything. I needed to know the kinds of things that Jeopardy asks about. They ask about um, Shakespeare a ton. So did I read every Shakespeare play? No, that is not a very efficient use of my preparation time. And honestly, it's probably too much detail, but I, you needed to know that Cordelia is King Lear, right? You need to know that Horatio or Ophelia is Hamlet. And that's the kind of thing that they'll use as the, as the clue about the clue. You, de you do not need to know that, you know, um, you know, in act whatever of this play, Hamlet or, or Ophelia says blah, 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 blah. You don't need to know the line from the play. What you do need to know is that Ophelia is Hamlet, right? So that's the kind of memory that I'm really good at where something very quickly triggers it's, it's like the kind of memory that a lot of people have where um, they, their friend can say a line from a, a, a movie and they can finish it, right? It's the same kind of thing where A gets you to B very quickly. Um, there was a question in the, the Tournament of Champions that I was in where it was like, this, this painter painted blah, 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 inc including fiddlers on, on roofs, right? And so I knew, I mean, it took me a second to actually get it, but it's like, there's one painter associated with that motif and it's Marc Chagall, right? So, so that's the kind of thing that you get really good at. You know the kinds of things that they ask about. Um, 
and you just focus really on that, on that relational information. Now, the thing is that like for things that you're interested in, it's really easy to remember, right? If you are a baseball fan, you know the players, you know the teams, you know, if I say George Brett, you know I'm talking about the Royals, right? There are these kinds of things that, that people can connect very easily. If you're into cars, if you're into fashion, it's like there, whatever it is, if you're into reality TV, you know who all these people are, you know who's like, I, I mean, I cannot name, you know, half of the Kardashians, but if you talk to people who are into this, they know everyone, they know everyone they dated, they know who they were, who, what their kids are named, they know all of this stuff, right? And it's, it's insane to people who aren't interested in it. And the, the people that do well on Jeopardy just happen to be interested in a ton of stuff. It's easy to remember things that you're interested in. And so one of the things that I did, and I talk about this a little bit in the audiobook, is I found ways to make the things I wasn't interested in interesting to me. And I worked really hard at that for things like sports, which I'm not like a big sports guy, or um, really just dry fact stuff. I made, I found different ways to make it interesting by either like digging in and finding out some interesting narrative information, um, like watching sports documentaries, all of a sudden dramatizing these people makes it interesting to me. Or um, I would make the preparation interesting, such as I would keep track of how I did on things, like how, how well I did when on my flashcard sets and just try to beat that <coughs> or try to be consistent, try to say, all right, I'm going to do it every day, eat, no matter what. So those were two ways that I kept myself focused on stuff that frankly uh, generally doesn't keep me that interested in. Makes sense. Um, so a few more questions have come through. Uh, one that I really, really like that Russ sent over is, um, do you think that Alex knows the answers? He always makes it seem like he does. No, he doesn't. Uh, he definitely doesn't. Um, <laughs> uh, um, I love the definitely would, to like punctuate it. I mean, it. here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I think there's probably a lot of stuff that he has learned. I mean, he, he's, he likes to read. He's, a, he's like into culture. So there's a lot of the stuff that he has learned over the years um, also from doing the show. Right. So it's the same thing. Like there have been 36 seasons and he has read these clues over and over again. So I bet he knows like all of Eugene O'Neill's plays or at least recognizes them. Right. So like he might not remember off the top of his head who wrote in for misbegotten, but then when he sees Eugene O'Neill, he gets to be like, it's Eugene O'Neill. And the other thing is that he gets the whole show, he gets the shows, you know, a few hours before us um, and before, you know, tape. And he goes through them and makes sure that he can pronounce everything. Uh, he asks questions, asks them sometimes to rewrite clues to make them clear. So um, he's, he's like kind of dived into the material in a way. He's, he's incredible professional and he comes from a news casting background and I think that's a lot of what people get when they feel like he knows what he's saying is if you actually listen to it he's almost reading it like a news report and I think he the way that uh, you know it's sort of the Ron Burgundy joke right like they seem like they're these pillars of like you know the Edward R. Murrow era of newscasting or Tom Brokaw or whoever whoever you know you grew up with you know Ted Koppel or uh, you know whatever um, but, you know, the camera goes off and they're just people that have this skill. Um, and I think that that is, he's, I mean, he's very good and it's a very hard um, job just to keep track of, you know, where you are in the game, who's got control. There's a lot of things that he's juggling and he still manages to stay incredibly focused on, you know, reading super clearly. Um, and yeah, so I do, that's a long answer to say, I do not think he knows a lot of that stuff. And he, and okay. I, when they go back to taping, hopefully, um, you know, because these are SoCal folks, you should really try to go to a taping because he answers uh, audience questions. And one of the things that comes up a lot is people ask, how do you think you'd do? And he's like, I, I would not do well. He, he says it's because he doesn't think he's fast enough. But um, I also think, you know, he knows, 
the, the stuff he knows, he really knows the stuff he's interested in. Like I said, he really knows. And you can tell when he really knows something, cause I'll add a little extra, um, <coughs> excuse me, but there's a lot of stuff that I think he's, he's reading. <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. Um, so someone, you mentioned a lot of Shakespeare, um, yeah. and those classics and things. So did the core help you with some of those answers? A hundred percent. I think just not having to, at 30 years old, like learn all of the characters in the Iliad and Odyssey, learning all that, you know, the Greek drama stuff, um, just having a real, um, fluency with the canon and the canon is a lot of what Jeopardy's playing with um including you know classical music that's a really hard category for a lot of people and those of us who went through Columbia College undergrad you know we had to get through music hum we had to get through art hum and that um that even if it's not everything it gives you at least like a scaffolding to build the rest of the information on right so um, you during the Baroque period, you might not cover every um, painter that Jeopardy is going to ask about in the Baroque period, but you have enough that you can then say, oh, yeah, OK, I'm going to group the these new people that I'm learning in with this person that I already know. So um, it definitely, definitely helps. Um, and when I'm in training, I will say I can rattle off all like, I mean, I bore people to tears, just <laughs> rattling off all this stuff. And <laughs> it comes back faster because I feel like I have that core curriculum background um, uh, yeah. where I'm used to kind of holding that stuff. Yeah. I think we need to add that to the brochure. If you want to, yeah. if you ever want to go on Jeopardy, <laughs> the core is going to help you. It's going to get you halfway there. Um, yeah. I know you talk about this a little bit in your book, um, about the strategy in playing the board. Um, mm -hmm. so what was your strategy? Did you go for the high price first, like James Holhauser? Did you do something else? Um, my, what, what my, um, well, here's the thing. Okay. So the, the most valuable tile for you to get or, and conversely not get is the daily double on, on the board. Um, because it, it, it just, it's just a huge piece to play, right? Um, and my style of play was kind of about neutralizing that, whether it was, you know, I, I would occasionally play it. I, would, I got more comfortable playing it bigger, but I was sort of like a volume player. So I just wanted as many questions as possible. Um, but having control of that dilly double is, is really crucial. And what you figure out is a, there are certain categories where it's more likely to show up. So if there is a <coughs> pop culture or wordplay category, less likely. If there is a geography, history, literature category, art, you know, this sort of like the core curriculum stuff or even geography, it's much more likely to show up there. So when you see those categories, you can start to say, okay, where am I going to get, where am I going to see the daily double? And daily doubles tend to show up, you know, in the bottom half of the board. So what I started doing was, you know, taking down, going, going through those categories and taking those bottom three clues when I could. And then, you know, then at the end, hopefully you've got a lead. And as you start to maybe fatigue a little bit, there's only low value clues left. So even if you're fatigued, you're basically giving the, the, the hardest clues, um, you know, your sharpest self. I didn't go full J Holtzauer because A, I'm not as strong a player as him to, to do that. And B, I was, I had a different, he was trying to rack up the cash and then the daily doubles were kind of the secondary piece of that. What I was trying to do was actually get the daily doubles first and the high value clue was the secondary piece of that. So I hope I've answered your question. Um, <laughs> I think so. It came <laughs> from a participant. So I think, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, a few more. Um, yeah. So I know that you talk about the, one of the reasons that you wanted to go on the show is because you really loved it. So would you classify yourself as a Jeopardy junkie before you went on? Um, so I have, I have an interesting relationship with it. So I, I watched it a lot when I was growing up. Um, and my parents always wanted me to go on the show because I would, you know, sit there 
like a little nerdy kid and rattle off the answers. And, um, and when I, you know, went off to college after college, I didn't have a television. So I kind of fell out of, you know, out of touch with the show, even though I still loved it. Um, excuse me. And I, um, it wasn't until I moved out here and my wife and I got the house and we actually, um, we were trying to watch the Academy Awards one year and we needed to buy uh, an antenna because we're, we are cord cutters. So I bought an antenna and um, I all of a sudden could watch Jeopardy every night and I started watching again. And I definitely became, definitely became a routine once again. It had been a routine when I was, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, about, you know, until I graduated high school. And then it became a routine again. And after a couple months or maybe a year of watching again, kind of every day, not, not totally religiously, but, you know, really trying to catch as many shows as I could. Um, they had an ad to take the test. Um, and I did it on a whim and I really didn't think anything would come of it. I went and had an audition like Arjun did. And, uh, I didn't think I did that well, but I also, one of the things they said, and I'm sure they said this to you is like, it's a game show, right? It's, it's not, you're not taking the foreign service exam and people come in and they are so intense about it. And what they really want to see is a lot of the things that I talk about in this audiobook. It's like, can you, can you present yourself? Can you keep your cool? Obviously you're smart if you did well enough to get in the room, but do you have the like, the wherewithal to actually present that intelligence in the way that you need to, and in a way that people can connect with it. Um, Cause they're, they're really trying to make entertainment. And I really took that to heart and I <laughs> tried to have fun when I had my audition and I tried to have fun when I was on the show. Um, at my audition, I actually like, <laughs> I kind of trash talked the other people a little bit, which maybe was like a, uh, like a, you know, a little bit of foreshadowing to what the rest of my Jeopardy career would be like. But they, I forget what they asked. And I was just like, you know, today is one of those few days in my life where I walked into the room and I knew I was the coolest person there. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, <laughs> just, just like, um, you know, in a sort of sarcastic way, but it, it you know, it like, and then everyone reacted. And it's like, you know, that kind of playfulness, um, I think, helped me, helped me on the show because you know, I, I really connected to the fact that I was just there to have fun. Um, the, the money was great. Um, uh, it still is great. But, you know, for me, it was really about just doing something that I've, oh, that I've always wanted to do. I, the first show when I buzzed in and Alex Trebek said my name and I answered correctly, like everything that came after that kind of like pales in comparison to that moment. That was like, that was what I was after. I wasn't after, I didn't think, I mean, I did. I just wanted to make it to Final Jeopardy in the first game. That was like, that was goal number two. Goal number one was to buzz in, hear Alex Trebek say my name and answer correctly. So once I did that, it's like everything after that was kind of gravy. And, and I just took that approach and it made everything easier. It made everything easier because people show up and they've got, you know, I played a guy who clearly, put a lot of pressure on himself to be, he was ready to be a Jeopardy phenom, right? And he, he, he kind of fell on his sword. He was really put a lot of pressure on himself. He made a lot of mistakes. He was, you know, and it was, I, the last chapter of the book I made, like it's called, can having fun be the point? Because what I found was that the more prepared I was, the more fun I had. And I think that that is something that, even though the preparation part isn't that fun, the big public, the opportunities for embarrassment or failure in some more meaningful way, those moments can be fun. And the more fun you're having, I think the better you do. I mean, even someone who is as intense as James Holzhauer or Ken Jennings, when you can see it, I mean, when they're playing, even though they're, they are doing it in their way, which is not my way, they're enjoying themselves, they're having fun because they're in control. And I think that that's like a big, those two things play off each other, right? Like the more relaxed you are, the easier it is to kind of like actually be in control because you're not reacting. You're not like, 
just reacting to everything that's happening. And the more in control you are, the easier it is for you to have fun because you don't feel like everything's just coming at you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, that resonates with me for sure. Um, cause I plan <laughs> events for a living. So I always have to be prepared right. for the unexpected. Um, yeah. like my computer deciding not to <laughs> let me get onto it when we're going to do a thing on a computer. Um, so, uh, someone has asked if you have aspirations to move into Alex Trebek's shoes one day. Uh, I, I, I would love to, and I told him that, and I told uh, the producers and the executive producers and the supervising producers, I told the people at CBS distribution that, I told everybody who would listen that Speak I was- Speak it ready. into existence. Yeah, um, I, I don't know that that's really gonna happen. Um, just based on when, when, when there was like the Sony email hack leak, a bunch of the Jeopardy ones, and a lot of those people are, are off the table now for a variety of reasons, such as Matt Lauer. Um, but like Anderson Cooper is someone who they talked about, Meredith Vieira, I think they've spoken about. Um, so I don't know that I am in consideration, but if they ask me, I would say yes. Um, that's awesome to know. <laughs> and then I could be like, I went to college with the Jeopardy host. That would be so great. That would, so really, I want you to do it so that I can brag about it and be right, like, yeah, right. we totally. But the should. problem is that now if I became the host, nobody who's on this call would be able to be a contestant. I am totally okay with that for myself. <laughs> I cannot speak for the other 16 people on the call. <laughs> um, okay, so who writes the questions? Are they, or actually, oh, yeah. because we were talking about hosting, um, someone said, I thought Alex preferred Laura Coates from CNN. Do you know that? You know, he, he gave a couple of people, I think he gave Laura Coates and he gave the guy who's the, the one of the broadcasters for the LA Kings. Um, but people ask him, but he doesn't decide. I mean, he's a producer on the show, but it's it's not up to him. Um, and I know, know the little I know about him, and um, I mean, this is recording, so I can't say it's off the record. I think, I mean, I think, you know, it's hard. It would be hard for anyone to to pick their own successor. So that's what I'll say about that. Sure. Um, <laughs> who writes the questions? Are they want to be contestants? Uh, no, so there's um, a really great team of writers um, that uh, have been working on the show for a really long time. Um, and there, then there's another half of the writing team that um, does uh, research. So just make sure that uh, the accuracy of the clues, making sure that there aren't multiple answers, or if there are multiple answers, that they, you know, will accept it or whatever. I had a, an instance where um, they... Uh, put up it was starts and ends with H was the category and they put up a sandwich and the other thing that you realize when you're there is like how far away the board seems and how much smaller the clues and the pictures and everything looks than when you're at home in front of your TV <clears throat> and so I looked at it across the stage and you know kind of squinted and I was like ham sandwich and they were looking for a hero sandwich um and they didn't accept it, but I, I disputed it. In, in the commercial breaks, you can dispute uh, a ruling. And I disputed it and I said, and they said, yeah, there's ham on that sandwich, we'll accept it. Um, and afterwards, at the there was like a little event after the tournament and they were one of the researchers was like, we had that down as a acceptable answer. So he should have, you know, he should have said yes, but he just quickly said no, because he was looking at hero. So there are these researchers that, um, and, and sometimes when something happens on the show, the producers or, you know, executive producer will pick up the phone and these researchers are still in a room, another room on the lot. And they've got, in addition to, the, you know, their computers, they've got, you know, hard copies of Encyclopedia Britannica and the OED and all of these other um, resources. And they will be checking before you even can test it if they're like, oh, maybe we missed something on this. But the, the writers are great. They have all of their clues, um, you know, documented. So they are very careful not to ask things twice. What's interesting is if you're a longtime viewer, you probably noticed that um, the categories used to be things like science, geography, Shakespeare, blah, blah. And now it's like, you know, cities that start with C 
you know, what's happening in science and it's a little flashier or cuter or they, and I spoke, uh, I spoke with the head writer and, and she was, I went, when I went to the taping, she was like, well, it used to be like a cardboard piece thing that was the category. And um, so it just was easier to not have to come up with a bunch of new categories thing. They would reuse them. But now that it's all screens, it's really easy and, and they can be more playful with it um, and do more stuff like that. But that was the reason that it used to be kind of a little more like school subjects um, because they wanted to, they didn't want to have to remake for every show 12, you know, custom signs. Just sounds like and, laziness to me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, tw 12, 12 categories or tw 13 categories every show, five shows a day. That's 75, no, 65. Uh, it's an absurd number five. of things. <laughs> yeah, two or three shoot days per, you know. So anyway, it's like a little bit, a little bit about that. But Yeah, so even with the change in how they kind of post the categories, how many, about how many categories would you say you had to be familiar with to win at the show yeah i mean i think um well i i could pull out my my flash card set and tell you um um but what i really think is it's like geography um you know geography u.s history world history art literature um current events is a big one that a lot of people sleep on wordplay as a category very hard to work on and people who are good at it like when they get those wordplay categories, they clean up. Like Ken Jennings is probably the best wordplay guy I've ever seen on the show. And when he played against James and Brad at the GOAT tournament, you know, James is a great player. He's not as good at wordplay as Ken is. And Ken just like swept the floor with him. And that's the kind of thing that like doing a lot of crossword puzzles, looking at a lot of looking through the archives there's an online fan generated archive and <clears throat> there's usually at least one wordplay category every day or every other day so that's something like anagrams starts and ends with c or uh, a, even a before and after is sort of a wordplay um, those are really hard categories if you're not good at that stuff because you're kind of trying to figure out how it works while you're on the show i mean this happened to me where it was like, I forget what the category was called, but it was basically like it had a, it was something about a number, like a number in the middle or something like that. And it would ask a clue and I couldn't figure out what the, what the wordplay thing was, but basically it was like an answer was mezzanine because it had nine inside of it, right? The word nine at the end of mezzanine or, you know, I, I can't think of them off the top of my head right now, but it like, I couldn't figure out what the connection was from the clue and the category and it was really messing me up um and so just doing more of that kind of wordplay stuff for me at least i think that's that's definitely a, a weak spot that i had to work on mm -hmm. we're yeah science you know things like a war it, there, there are lists of things that are just really easy to to learn you know um host cities of the olympics really easy like uh and also like now you know another city in in uh whatever country you know even though they're usually big cities but things like that um pulitzer prize uh national book award um i when um all stars was taping it was going to air i looked at i looked at when it was going to air because a lot of times they'll do clues that are kind of jokes about what's happening then so like if your show's going to air on St. Patrick's Day, there might be a, you know, Lucko the Irish category, which is all about Ireland or Irish Americans or something like that. And I saw that we were airing right around the Academy Awards. So I memorized all the best picture, best actor, best director. Um, um, uh, and then I did, and then additional Oscar trivia of like notable things. So like longest speech, shortest speech, only person that has an Olympic medal and uh, Academy Award, only people that have Nobel prizes and Academy, like things like that, where it's just like kind of trivia around the Academy Awards. And of course, how many ca Academy Award categories came up? None, not one, after all that work. <laughs> but I was uh, ready if it did. Uh, well, yeah, preparation, you know? <laughs> um, 
So a couple of things about that preparation process. Um, Rick asked, uh, what methodology is more important than memory or memorization? And Miriam asked, did you meditate before the show? Hmm. Um, so I actually um, grew up, uh, well, grew up, like when I was about 14, I did a lot of meditation. Uh, and I was actually the president of the Columbia Buddhist Meditation Group uh, cool. when I was there in my junior and senior year. Um, so, but I, I, my whole thing was, uh, about going into the show was making the experience as much like any other day as possible. Um, and so because I'm not really meditating now, um, it's, it's a tricky thing because on one hand you do want to kind of settle yourself down, but you also, I think need a little bit of the anxiety to kind of sharpen you um and get you a little more like alert and then you might be coming out of i mean I, the kind of meditation i used to do was was very much about a kind of alertness but it also kind of like you know i needed my muscles kind of twitching and stuff like that um so i didn't do any of that stuff but my approach was kind of to make if if i had been a daily meditator i would have meditated beforehand if i whatever like whatever I was doing on tape day, I made sure it was being done at least a few weeks beforehand. And I take that approach now, like with my work stuff, like I try to make any situation as much a part of my daily life as possible. So that, you know, coming into this tonight, I mean, I haven't really been wearing the suits as much because of quarantine because my dry cleaner is closed. But I, you know, before this, I wore a suit and a tie every day. So that when some, when an opportunity like this comes up, I can put the suit and the tie on and I feel comfortable and I know everything's going to fit. I know how to tie the tie. I'm not sitting there thinking about, Oh, do I look stupid? Does this fit me right? All this stuff. And I, and I do that with, with like everything, you know? And so that's kind of my approach. Um, and then can you remind me of Rick's question or something about memory? Yes. If there's um, another meta methodology that's more important than memory. Well, I think that memory is really important in this sort of relational way that that I discussed of, of you know, being able, whatever the key word is uh, for for an idea to have it trigger that. So if it's like, you know, 1996 Olympics, you got to get right to Atlanta, right? Or if it's um, 1927, there's two things that you need to know about 1927, right? The Yankees and Charles Lindbergh. So when you hear 1927, it's one of those two things, probably, right? That's, that's, those are the, they, in the Jeopardy world, they call these Pavlovs, right? So when you hear 1927, your automatic response is gonna be either Lindbergh or Yankees. And hopefully the rest of the clue makes it really clear if they're asking about the Yankees or Charles Lindbergh, right? I mean, there's not a lot of overlap between those two concepts other than 1927. <clears throat> so working on those Pavlovs, and I worked, I used a, a, a study uh, tool called Anki, which is a flashcard app that works on a principle called the forgetting curve and sequence repetition so that I wasn't having to just reread all this stuff over and over again. It basically just feeds you the information when you should be forgetting it or right on the line. But I think what's more important than the content because a lot of people are really good at drilling on content, right? So whatever it is, like if you have to do a speech or a sales pitch or whatever, you're probably really good at the material of it. And what people aren't as good at is the context. When am I going to do it? How am I going to be feeling? What's going to go wrong? What is the temperature going to be? I mean, it seems so dumb when I say it out loud and yet, you get up there and people, you know, someone's freezing their butt off and they can't concentrate or they're sweating bullets because they're wearing a parka and it's like an outside, you know, whatever it is, or they're really tired. I mean, my thing is like, I'm, I'm a big coffee drinker. And so uh, the way I am after, you know, my third, fourth, fifth, sixth cup of coffee, you know, all of that is a sliding scale. And do I perform the same? Am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? Am I like about to fall asleep when I'm giving a sales pitch after lunch? Or am I like going a mile a minute at 10 a.m. when I just had a second cup of coffee and I didn't eat enough for breakfast? 
and I'm all over the place. So I think, you know, what you can do is start to practice when you, when you prepare for the, the, and maybe I'm stressed, maybe I'm not, how do I recreate that stressful situation? Um, I think we're all seeing this in interesting ways in the zoom era where, um, you know, where we're having to kind of present ourselves a certain way in a different context, right? We're in our homes. Sometimes our families are around and it's, it's a very different experience and we, we are unpracticed at it, right? We are unpracticed at it. Even, you know, if we've been in the workplace for five, 10, 15, 20 years, we know we've kind of have been forced. If we still have a job, we've been forced to like, figure out how to present in a workplace, but we do not have that practice uh, in a digital form. And people need, you know, why not call a friend and practice talking through something, getting used to a bunch of people talking over you on a Zoom call and how do you keep your composure, not lose your place. There's all of these things. How do, you know, before I get on a Zoom call, every time I open up the photo booth and just like, look at what's behind me and it's just an easy thing. And yet it's like, I can't tell you how many times I start a call, someone calls in and then all of a sudden they realize like I'm seeing all their laundry and they spend five minutes like cleaning up the room. Yeah. And I mean, it's not a big deal for me, but for them, I, I mean, maybe they feel fine about it, but if you had a, if you have like a big event, you might, or a big, you know, an important presentation you might feel some kind of way about it so that's the kind of things I don't know if I kind of went off a little bit Rick but I think that to me content people really like to to work on because it's it's abstract it's easy and con context is usually the part that's that people kind of don't take into account and that I stress a lot in the audiobook because I think that that's the thing that um, Oh, it, it gets in the way of really smart or capable or, or uh, hardworking people from, from accomplishing their goals more than the content, right? Because if they really care about this thing, whatever it is, if it's their business, if it's their, um, you know, their best friend whose wedding it is, they, you know, they care about this. They know the stuff. So why do people mess up? It's because they're not preparing for the context that they're going to have to be talking about that in. And so that's a, a really big thing that I really stress. And whether it's on Jeopardy, whether it is, you know, speaking at your friend's wedding, or, you know, I, I think a lot of people are going to be doing Zoom job interviews uh, in the next couple of weeks and months. And it's going to be important to figure out how to present yourself the way that you want to in this. And this is, this is a different context. Um, being in your home is a different context. Um, so that, that's the kind of things that I, I really stress to people. I had a friend, this is a total aside, but I had a friend who was a psychologist who was, had a job interview that I was very excited about, which was to be a, um, a profiler for the FBI. So like that, I mean, it sounded kind of cool to me. Um, you know, our feelings about, we'll leave our feelings about law enforcement outside of the Zoom. But, you know, just that idea, I mean, like that's, you know, where you're like, you know, it's like the Clarice from, uh, from uh, Silence of the Lambs, right? Um, so I, she was like, I really want this job. Da, 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 da. And I was like, cool. Um, and I was like, where's the, where, where's the office? She's like, oh, it's in downtown. And I was like, what's the parking situation like over there? And she was like, I don't know. And I was like, well, I bet I, I would think about that because I've had to do things downtown. And the next thing you know, you can't find a parking spot. You park in a lot five blocks away and you're running through downtown LA and it's hot and, and you're late and tired and you already feel like shit and you haven't even started, right? So here, here's something easy like the day and go the same day of the week because there are parking restrictions, go the same day of the week that you're going to have to have this interview and at 9 a.m. or whatever and see what the traffic's like, what the parking's like, all that stuff. And just like take all of those variables and get them out of the way. And it doesn't take that long. And 
if this is really something you care about, it's worth it, right? And, and anything that you care about, you're going to be stressed, right? Because you care about it. You want it to do well. You want to succeed. So take out as many of the things that are compounding that stress as possible. Yeah. Um, just so you know, after this, you're going to be my life coach because I need to like <laughs> all the time. Um, we are running out of time. So I'm going to shift this back over yeah. to your book for our last couple of questions. Um, the first one being what was the hardest thing to about writing your book? Um, I, I, the hardest thing for me was just the idea that I was like a valid voice. Right. Um, and I think, um, there's a chapter about imposter syndrome and that was something that really, it came up for me with Jeopardy and it continues to come up for me in the trivia world because you meet these people and they're brilliant. You know, they're so brilliant and they're, they know everything. And I'm just like, I don't know. I'm kind of like, just, uh, I know some stuff. I'm like, um, but then writing the book, it's like, you know, I look at the other books that have been written about performance and it's like, you know, these, you know, Anders Ericsson, PhD, um, you know, it's all these people who are, uh, you know, professors and have spent their life, their, 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 <laughs> you know, their, their adult lives studying this stuff. And I, and so what I really had to do was say, okay, well, I'm just coming at this from a, a really different point of view. And that point of view is valid. Uh, and, and it, I had to kind of keep saying that to myself, like, all right, I'm not writing I'm not an academic. I'm, I'm not, I'm writing this as somebody who, who, who isn't speaking to people who want to know how Olympic athletes train. They want to know how they can do better in, you know, a first date next week or, you know, whatever it is, this is, this is coming at it from, and, and because I'm not a naturally very motivated person, um, the the way that I the ways that I found to motivate myself and to make this work I feel like ha, had something to like could speak to people who aren't the normal um, self improvement kind of person um, and that I could also make it fun I mean those books are interesting but they're boring right um, at least that's my opinion of them <laughs> um, so so yeah that honestly that was the hardest thing to to like every, every single, I mean, every single time I would deliver something to my editor, I would say like, is this good? It's like, do we care about this? Is this, do you think people are going to want this? And she kind of kept having to, to unfortunately like, yeah, this is like, you know, this is really different than everything else that's out there. It's, it's a different point of view. And, and so, yeah, that was, for me, that was the hardest part. And reading it, reading it was really hard. So this is not a print book. This is an audio, audio first book because Audible is my publisher. So um, I, I flew out to Newark where Audible studios are. And I just read for like, like all day for three days. And that was, that was also really hard. And I, I prepared for it, but you know, I would get back. I was, I ended up staying with my grandma who still lives in New Jersey. And I would like get back to her house at five o'clock or five thirty, And I would like, kind of fall apart like just crash out because it was it was physically exhausting um and just staying that focused making sure i wasn't speaking too quickly making sure i didn't you know another thing that people do a lot when they read is they kind of get sing-songy so they end every sentence the same way and then they get, and then you kind of like lulls the listener as well into kind of uh they stop paying attention because they can tell that the reader is sort of not totally engaged with it. So having to keep all like focused on all that stuff was really hard after I kind of got through the actual writing. Well, you did an excellent job with the reading. <laughs> I did listen to it. Um, and on that note, um, this will be the last question. Um, Sorry, another one came in and I like that question too. So I'm going to ask it. And then okay. the other one is really just about where to get your book. So that'll be a good oh, note sure. to end on. Um, so how did you prepare to read your book for three days? Okay. Um, well, I asked, I asked a lot of questions and that was um, like often the first thing that people don't do, right? 
Um, so for instance, like when I was doing this or when I, when I've done other podcast interviews, I asked for the questions beforehand. I asked a lot of questions about the studio. I asked about parking. Um, <laughs> I asked about, um, you know, what the schedule was going to be. Um, and then I, I spent some time reading the, reading some sections. I didn't spend a lot of time. I was, again, I was really familiar with the material, but I was spending some time reading sections, recording it, listening back, seeing how I felt about it. Um, I spent, I, I decided I was going to record on my feet because I thought I would, my voice would be more engaged. And so I would practice, you know, Hey, I'm going to, whatever my next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to do it on my feet for an hour or something like that at a time of day when I knew I was going to be reading. So it was very similar to the way that I approached Jeopardy. I would just take apart different aspects of the, um, of what the process was going to be like, and then just, you know, kind of trained, trained to each of those things. And then did a couple of kind of scrimmages where I would stand up and, you know, have a microphone in front of me, even if it wasn't on and just sort of see what it was like reading. And, um, yeah, it, it ended up going pretty well. They seemed very happy. We finished a day earlier than they had scheduled it. So I guess I, we didn't have to redo as much as they thought we might. So yeah, again, I just tried to take it apart, understand it from the inside out, ask, really understand what the process was going to be like and prepare myself for that and not just prepare myself for what I imagined it might be or, uh, only prepare for part of it. So, yeah. Very nice. Well, as I said, very good job on the book. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you all you. for coming. Yeah. Thank you for so much for spending this time with us. I know it's getting really dark for you and for me, so it's probably <laughs> a good indication that this is time to stop. I didn't have, I didn't have lights on before. So. Same. Um, I was using the natural light and now yeah. the natural light has gone. Um, so Buzzy's book is an Audible original. You can get it on Audible. I don't know how much it costs, but if you're a member, you can use a credit. Um, and yeah, I know that we didn't get to a couple of the questions that people had, but if you want to send them over to the club at SoCal at alumni clubs.columbia.edu, we can shoot them over to Buzzy and yeah. we hope that you join us for our future events. We've got virtual happy hours every week. We've got a couple of other talk type events coming up. And if you have ideas for things that you'd like to see, speakers that you'd like to see or types of content, we would love to hear it. So thank you so much for joining us. Take care, everybody. Have a great night. <laughs>